Hello and welcome to the Nexus. Today's show, Hungry for Democracy. The country's leader, Viktor Orban, won this month's vote by a landslide. Yet he's the one being accused of being a dictator. Is that right? Do we really have a dictator inside the EU? We're going to be looking at the evidence, including Orban's battles with his fellow EU leaders who are struggling right now to control him, even thinking of ways to sanction his government. We'll be examining his media monopoly. With so much power over TV, radio and newspapers inside Hungary, how can observers say he won fair and square? And why did that chicken run for office? That is a serious question. All that and more coming up right now in the Nexus. Hello, I'm Matthew Moore, and today in the Nexus, it is Viktor Orban. Is this EU leader a Democrat or dictator? Make up your own mind with the help from Justin Spike. Now, he used to work at the online newspaper, the Budapest Beacon, which shut down just last week. Zandor Ziros, he's a correspondent with Euronews. He's travelled with Mr Orban, says he's an intelligent and kind man in person. And finally, David Sabo. Now, he works at a conservative pro-government think tank, and he believes that Brussels is definitely conspiring to put pressure on Mr Orban. Well, now we're all gathered. Let's watch the first of our three reports. This one's looking at Orban's battles. Hungary's Prime Minister is celebrating today a crushing general election victory. Things could hardly have gone better for Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Another election, another overwhelming victory. Conservative leader Viktor Orban is looking forward to a third successive term as Prime Minister. Justin. Help us make sense of what happened in Hungary with Viktor Orban. I mean, this was, it, it was more that it was anti-immigration um, kind of rule of law concerns and the economy's not doing great. So why did people vote for him? We Central Europeans want to completely reform our migration policy. Migration turned out to be the Trojan horse of terrorism. Borders must be taken under full control. In many countries, when there's xenophobia, it's raised by marginal parties, it's raised by right-wing parties. What's unusual in Hungary is to see the government trying to whip up xenophobia. A legrosszabb rémámaink válnak valóra. A nyugat elesik, miközben Európa észre sem veszi, hogy megszállják. Bármilyen kérdésben kész vagyok kritizálni az Európai Uniót, kész vagyok vitát folytatni a brüsszeli bürokratákkal. The dictator is coming. The Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban warned that politicians in Brussels, Berlin and Paris are going to destroy Western civilization with their enthusiasm for mass migration. The future of Europe is casting a shadow on the present of Europe. George Soros, uh, that American, Hungarian-born businessman, who is portrayed kind of like evil number one. The government's claiming the billionaire George Soros is trying to interfere in the country's internal policies. The current government's attempt to intimidate and discredit civil society is totally unacceptable. Kedvenc politikai filozófusom, egy bizonyos Rocky, Rocky Balboa, azt mondta, mindig a végén van vége. Well, the gloves are off. Let's go to David Szabó. David, uh, before we get on to the whole Democrat uh, dictator question, why does Orbán like to portray himself as Rocky? Is he, he thinks of himself as the underdog, does he? I think that uh, the Prime Minister indeed enjoys uh, fighting, fighting on the international scene, fighting... Um, for this medium-sized country, this medium-sized power uh, in Europe and, uh, and, and his vision, which is supported by the voters. Uh, I think uh, quoting Rocky Balboa is a clear sign that uh, the Prime Minister is willing and able to talk uh, to his voters all over uh, Hungary, not only in Budapest, not only uh, to intellectuals, uh, but to all those who are familiar okay. with popular culture. Okay, let's go to Zandor now. He's actually uh, to met uh, Viktor Orban in person. What's he like? When I met him in person in, in the past, he was always uh, 
showing some interest towards uh, everyone. And the people who really are close to him admire him because of his intelligence. And, uh, but about Orban, you need to know that he's a fighter. Uh, he, he has a, he's not a one-dimension man. He has uh, this warmth, but also he can be very, very nasty, very rude if you are close to him and uh, if you are in conflict with him. Mm. Justin, uh, a quick question for you. Would you say Democrat or dictator? I think that uh, Viktor Orban started as a Democrat. Uh, his party, Fides, is actually an acronym for the, the Young Alliance of Democrats. So he was a really prominent Democrat in this country until he took a, a very distinct turn. Some people put that at around uh, the year 2000 or so. And at this point, I would say that uh, Mr. Orban and his party are sort of masquerading uh, as Democrats and, uh, and, and masquerading democratic institutions. Uh, when in fact the structure which, with which the structure that they have uh, instituted here in Hungary looks increasingly less democratic and well, more we're gonna, authoritarian. We're, we're going to dig down into that, but first of all, let's just take a look at the raw numbers. If you have a look at the election, his party won as many votes as all the others put together. In fact, he won a bigger share of the vote than the last election, and all that with a turnout of nearly 70%. Justin, I have to come back to you. I mean, on the face of it, it looks like a very healthy democracy. Yeah, sure. Uh, we look at the, at the numbers. I, I believe it's about 49% of the vote that, uh, that Fidesz won. Um, but what you really have to ask yourself is that what happens with the other 50% of the voters and who is going to serve their interests and, uh, and represent their values? And I think that uh, I would agree with the other two guests. Yes, Viktor Orban is a fighter, um, but what he has done in Hungary in the last few years is create a system in which he has set up these these enemies internal and external uh, against which to defend uh, the Hungarian people and I, I, I see it as a, a way of consolidating his power and basically telling the other half of the country if you're not with us you're against us. Uh, David if I can come back to you the OSCE said that the atmosphere was quite intimidating, it was quite xenophobic, and if we go back a couple of years, we know that, of course, Viktor Orban built that, uh, that separation barrier between uh, Hungary and Serbia and Croatia, and he was saying, look, look, I just need to enforce the European rules here and shut the back door to all the, uh, the, the migrants and refugees trying to come up and choose whichever country they want. But the, the atmosphere during the election... That, that was uh, marked by strong xenophobic language, wasn't it? I do not think that this was particularly xenophobic. Uh, however, I think that uh, this was a very tough campaign with definitely not a moderate tone. That okay. I do not deny. Uh, let, let, me ask, let me ask Justin. Justin, how would you categorize the rhetoric during the campaign about migrants and refugees? Were they being used as a scapegoat, something to terrorize the, the population into voting for Orban once again? There's no question about it. I mean, uh, a competitive campaign is one thing, but the, a constant barrage of, of fearful images in, in all of the government-aligned media, including the state media, if you were to turn on the channel M1, which is the, which is the state television, it's basically nothing more uh, than a constant stream of images of throngs of, of African and Middle Eastern immigrants, I mean, it's uh, not only is it xenophobic. In my view, it has it, it during the campaign at least it it reached a truly racist uh, tone, which which appears to me to is, uh, serve no. What, what I'm ahead. interested to know is is whether Orban is leading that opinion or whether he's actually reflecting it. If we take a look at a survey here from 2016, shortly after the, the, the peak of the crisis, the migrant and refugee crisis, we see that actually it was Pew Research came out with 59% across the EU, the median, uh, was, were worried that migrants would increase domestic terrorism. And then as far as the EU's handling of it goes, 63% said they were very unhappy with the EU's handling of it. So, I mean, to, to leave it in the hands of the, at the European Union, the Brussels level, it seems that would also be undemocratic. Sure, but uh, I think to say that you don't think that the EU has handled the migration crisis well is not also to say that probably we should just put a wall up at the southern border and those people on the other side can fend for themselves. Sander, is there a conspiracy at the highest levels to, to bring Orban down, or at least to put him in his place? We're hearing about the European Parliament is coming up with sanctions. No, no, no. I think Orban is still part of the system. He has very good connections with the European Commission uh, President Jean-Claude Juncker. 
he is, uh, his party, Fidesz, is in the biggest political family of the European People's Party. Mm. We have seen these debates in the last eight years about uh, kicking them out from the EPP or not. These debates are still ongoing. There are many associates uh, of this party who are criticizing Orban. They want to get rid of him. But Orban knows the rules in Brussels and he knows how to play this game. And so far he was uh, successful in this. OK, let me bring in David. What do you think, David? They're, they're conspiring at the Brussels level to bring him down? I think there are very, very serious forces uh, from not only the Brussels bureaucracy, but also from some of the member states elites to restrain the Orban effect, to uh, put a break on uh, the spread of popular democracy in the EU when uh, not only intellectuals or uh, bigger, older member states elites uh, would set a path for the EU, but actually some people like Orban, like, uh, like um, yeah. uh, the Polish Prime Minister, they listen to the people's will. And I think the biggest, the biggest constraint for these uh, coordinated efforts to 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 limit Hungary, to limit Orban's uh, influence, uh, the biggest obstacle to these efforts is European public itself. I just want to show you or replay the picture where Jean Claude Juncker greets him and says, "Ah, dictator." and then gives him a friendly slap on the face. Now, this is Jean-Claude Juncker. He's the president of the European Commission. He certainly didn't win a popular vote, and he's calling Viktor Orban dictator. Is this a... this, this seems odd at, any, at some level. Well, yeah, Juncker has a special style, and uh, he's actually in a very friendly connections with uh, many European leaders. I don't think that it's... Uh, it was a serious uh, sentence, <laughs> uh, calling Viktor Orban a dictator, but clearly Juncker is one of these people who can openly uh, play this game with Orban. None of the other uh, yeah. leaders here in, in Brussels would dare to do this with David, Orban, but Juncker can do it. Sure. David, um, w when people in Hungary watch that, that footage, are they en angry, embarrassed? But Brussels never really understands fully that uh, if this was to be a humiliating gesture, then it is reaching exactly the opposite effect. So mm -hmm. Hungarians, whenever they receive a threat, uh, unfair criticism, double standards, or anything like that from abroad, they tend to stick together and they tend to stick behind the government. I think uh, this footage was rather seen as an odd one out, and then we saw a lot of various examples from how Juncker is treating others, offering his tie to Alexis Tsipras from Greece, and so on. So. I think uh, it was more part of the comedy uh, and relaxed part of Brussels politics. All right. Well, while Orban and his party are very popular in Hungary, how popular would they be if they didn't control the media? It was a huge factor in the election. Take a look. This is MTV, the famous one we all know and love. Lots of colour, lots of fun. And this is Hungary's MTV. A somewhat somber affair, which has very little in common with the American music channel, except those three initials. Magyar Televizio is Hungary's oldest TV broadcaster and has been thrilling Hungarians since 1959. It's owned and managed by a government body which dominates Hungary's media, controlling the main radio broadcaster and the biggest news agency too. Switch on the TV, tune in the radio or open a newspaper in Hungary and it's pretty much all Orban all the time. Something which worries outside observers. Its newscasts and its editorial outputs clearly favor the ruling coalition. So state-owned channels give most of their airtime to Viktor Orban and his Fidesz party, but so do private media companies. How did it come to this in a democracy in the heart of the European Union? Well, one of the first things Orban did when elected back in 2010 was to change Hungary's media laws. A journalist can now be fined a lot if they're convicted of inciting hatred against any majority, in other words, the government. And in 2014, the government started hitting top commercial media companies with big taxes. For example, German-owned RTL Club, which is critical of the government, saw its ad revenues hit hard. Still, that's OK. Orban doesn't like foreigners owning media in Hungary anyway. And nekem az a személyes meggyőződésem, hogy a nemzeti szuverenitásnak része, hogy egy országban működő média rendszer többségének nemzeti kézben kell lennie. And so, you're more likely to find stations now owned by his mates. 
Men like Andy Vajner, the former Hollywood producer on blockbusters like Terminator and Rambo, can now add Hungarian media tycoon to his business card after buying up a whole batch of the country's media companies. And gas fitter turned multi-millionaire Lorenz Mazaros, an old schoolmate of Orban's, also has a big slice of the media game. In fact, these two, along with a third man, Heinrich Pecina, own every single one of Hungary's regional newspapers. In fact, it's estimated that 90% of all Hungary's media is linked either directly or indirectly to the Fidesz party. Boy, have they got news for you. Let's go straight to Budapest now. And David, David, shaking your head. At first you were smiling, then you were crying. What's the issue with our report? Yeah, um, with all due respect, sir, uh, I really don't find it very factual, not uh, the piece about the European media or the Hungarian media regulation. I think those questions uh, were all discussed and uh, sorted out with the European Commission. So I do not think that anyone should be, any journalist should be fined for uh, disproportionate fines or a, a hate speech would, uh, you know, hate speech closure would uh, apply to government majority. Is it, is it and the true, other part is, is it the true that basically the government or uh, friends of Viktor Orban do basically run everything going in, in no. Hungary in terms of the media? Yeah. No, no, it's not true. That's the other part of my criticism. So um, if you look at the Hungarian media picture, you have the two biggest commercial channels. One is uh, very critical with the government. The other one is less critical with the government or more pro-government. The biggest daily newspapers until last week, there was almost a clear divide in the middle, uh, three opposition, three uh, non-opposition uh, newspapers. The online is completely, and I say completely dominated by very, very critical voices about, uh, about the government. And uh, radios are uh, the same. Uh, uh, OK, David, a uh, fairly robust defence there, but I have a feeling that Justin's going to be able to pick that apart quite easily. Uh, Justin, you can perhaps challenge what David has said there. So as, as your report mentioned, all 18 of the regional newspapers in Hungary are owned by Fidesz-connected oligarchs. Uh, and those newspapers, those print newspapers, are the most widely read uh, print media in Hungary, far more so than any of the national uh, dailies. So uh, Hungary is a country very much of countryside villages and small towns and cities. Uh, not everything can be viewed from the, from the lens of Budapest. Sure. It's easy for us to get stuck, uh, bogged down here in the capital with our, our capital affairs. And most people are getting their media from uh, the state television yeah. and from the regional newspapers and from these other media yeah. which are firmly in the hands of the government or, or oligarchs easily uh, tied to, to, you mentioned, to... You mentioned oligarchs. Actually, let's get into that gas fitter turned millionaire Lawrence Mazaros that we mentioned in the report. Orban's old school friend. He wasn't exactly doing financially very well uh, before Orban took power. Uh, now he controls hundreds of businesses that have been awarded dozens of government contracts, many of them funded by the EU. Uh, I'll, go, I'll go to Brussels for this one. Sander, uh, doesn't the European Union have its concerns about where its money is going to when it reaches Hungary? There is a very big uh, debate about uh, these EU funds in Brussels right now because uh, in this year, particularly, many decision makers realized that this money is actually going to the friends of uh, Viktor Orban and even to family members. David, uh, Viktor Orban's mates are all getting European Union money. It's great for them. Well, uh, Hungary is not only getting European Union money, but we're also uh, contributing. And yeah, but why is it going um, to Viktor Orban's buddies? Uh, there are uh, some money going to uh, businessmen uh, who have a more closer relationship with various politicians and some money goes to other businessmen. I do not see a, a trouble here and do not, do not, do not see that uh, some sort of political pressure from Brussels on uh, how to spend this money as long as it is uh, transparent, as long as it is uh, legally uh, spotless. Justin, no problem as long as it's transparent. The problem uh, only only occurs when you find uh, not only a few cases here and there, but an, uh, an almost unbelievable, overwhelming trend of uh, of those people receiving contracts to execute these kinds of developments are uh, are very very frequently tied to the government, and you see such a such a uh, a long series of successes by people tied to Orban and tied to the Fidesz party. You really begin to wonder how long this this uh, organized yeah. corruption can go on before the European Union has something to say about it. Justin, thank you for that. Well, finally, we answer the last question we posed in our headlines. Why did the chicken run for office? The short answer is because the government pays for it.
In Hungary, public money is given to every candidate to help them campaign. Seems very civilised, but unfortunately some people take advantage, setting up fake parties just to get their hands on all that lovely cash. And they don't seem to put much work into their branding. Some parties' names submitted to the National Elections Office are just a little bit suspect sounding. Here's our top five. Party for the poor. Party for all the poor. The Hungarian Party of Poor People and the Hungarian Party of People Who Want To Do. Sounds great. I mean, who doesn't want to do? But all these parties have now evaporated. So to sum up, we have the real parties, the fake parties, and then we have a third category of parties. They exist, but surely only to make us laugh, like the two-tailed dog party. Their campaign promises include two sunsets a day, eternal life, and loads and loads of express buses that go nowhere. Here's one of their candidates being interviewed on a so-called serious political TV programme. Yes, nuggets of political wisdom from a candidate who seems to be winging it. He only got that interview because the station promised five minutes of airtime to every party. And this chuck or hen mostly just read from their prepared statement. And not wishing to ruffle any feathers, the interviewer finally, gently, breaks in. Not exactly Frost Nixon, was it? Looks more like foul play to me. Oh boy, let's go, let's go back to David. Come on, David, you, you were smiling and laughing off camera. Now, what, 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 how, can you, how can you have a chicken man running for election? So, um, yeah, I think, um, first of all, what's funny is funny. I, I'm sorry, I'm just human. Um, <laughs> first of all, this party actually uh, gained more than 1% of the vote, of the national vote. So Chicken Man's party uh, <laughs> will, will, will receive government, government funding for four more years. And they actually have some goals and they will, do, they will use their, their funding. They, they are transparent about that. So that's one thing when a comedian party, you know, is running at elections. Uh, pirate parties, anti-establishment parties, even comic parties are running all over the world to, to, to run, you know, to ride on the anti-establishment sentiment or turning away from politics. That's one thing. The other thing is a general regulation in Hungary that is very, very liberal in terms of you can easily connect signatures, you can easily uh, enroll yourself into national elections, and then you have state funding for the campaign, which is, I think, more democratic than mm. the United States, where you have to have $1 million to run sure. a primary in, uh, in any uh, constituency, more or less, because you are absolutely out of resources. Um, it is these people who apply for resources, who enroll as candidates. It's mm. their responsibility what they do with the money and whether they repay it if they do not perform well enough. OK, Justin, uh, do you think this is the way that the Hungary, Hungarian government funds the, the parties is good for democracy or is it just a waste of money? Uh, well, in addition to being uh, a waste of money, I think that what you see, as you saw in, the, in this last election, uh, in Hungary the voting system works uh, largely by, by people voting for a party list. So they just <clears throat> check their X next to the party which they support the most, in addition to voting for individual candidates elsewhere. And when you look at this ballot list, it's just full of parties which you've never heard of and are here today and gone tomorrow. Yeah. And I think anybody can look at that and see that, uh, that such a wide selection obfuscates the real choices here. So these fake parties, and they're obviously fake, it's not as, uh, we could say that it was a boon to democracy mm. if, uh, if all of these fake parties were not fake, but actually represented by people with real ideas, with real platforms and ideologies who were actually seeking office. But this is not the case at all. All of these parties, down to the to the last one, are fake uh, in the strictest sense let's, of the let's word. Go back, let's go back to Brussels. Sander, uh, is this a, a source of amusement at the uh, Brussels level? People here were aware of this uh, <laughs> fake party okay. phenomenon, but it's nothing new in Europe. Uh, and especially especially if you look at the Balkans, it's, it's very commonly used. If you see the elections, the previous elections in Serbia, uh, Montenegro and other Balkanic states, uh, the ruling parties applied uh, this uh, fake party system systematically to divide the opposition and to distract uh, mm. uh, the, the voters' attention. For example, if you are a pensioner and you don't uh, have a good eyes or good uh, oh lenses, uh, and you want to vote for the socialist, but you have to choose from uh, 23 
different logos uh -huh. you don't necessarily find it but if, interestingly the logo of the fides was in the middle uh -huh. i'm not saying that it it was on purpose but uh, the, the 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 system of uh, yeah, running fake happen, parties is, is nothing to, new to fall in that Europe. way and it was uh, yeah look david's shaking his head but unfortunately we've run out of time it's a random draw how they how they put the, the, random. the parties on the list. Yeah, yes, yeah. it's random. The house it's always a, wins, oh. David. Come on. No, I don't, don't believe in that. By the way, uh, whoever says that the pensioners cannot read the voting ballot, God really doesn't believe in democracy. Either you do, either you don't. Uh, it's like Santa Claus. Either you believe in him or you don't. Uh, <laughs> I have right. nothing else to say. David Sabo, thank you very much. And Zandor Zeros, thank you also. And finally, uh, Justin Spike, thank you very much. Appreciate your contributions, all of you, to the Nexus this week. Well, that is it for now. Thank you for watching. Remember, you can get all of today's show and our previous shows on our YouTube channel. Do check that out. Thank you for watching and see you next week.